everyone. Now that we've talked about how DNA could lead to a protein through the process of transcription and translation, we need to come back to our cystic fibrosis case and understand a little bit more about the specific protein that we're talking about in cystic fibrosis and why it can be problematic. I hope when we come back to our case with Yvonne and Jeffrey, we can easily say that we understand about mutations now and that if we have a change in our nucleotide sequence in our DNA, that that could lead to a defective protein. We've talked about how proteins fold according to certain rules and that if we had an A where we normally would have a G in our DNA, then that could lead to a different amino acid in our protein. That would lead to our protein folding differently, and then we know that our protein may not work correctly. The question we have to answer now is, what is so important about this protein that we're talking about in cystic fibrosis? Where is the particular protein, and why is it causing so many problems for our patient Jeffrey and anyone with cystic fibrosis? In order to understand this, we need to take a closer look at cells that are in the respiratory system. Even though cystic fibrosis can affect many organs, we're going to focus in just on the respiratory system to try to understand why individuals with cystic fibrosis generate a thicker mucus that's hard to clear, whereas people who are healthy have a thin, watery mucus that's easy to remove. As we look at the respiratory system and the cells that are there, the particular protein that we're interested in studying is one that's actually embedded in the plasma membrane itself. We haven't talked a lot about the plasma membrane of cells in detail, and that's what we need to do here in this question set. So let's take a look at a plasma membrane. You have a picture in question set 12 that we'll take a look at, and we'll also take a look at some pictures from your textbook. Let's take a look at the figure that you have in your course manual at the general structure of the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is made up of many different small pieces that fit together to make an overall dynamic structure. You'll notice some of these pieces are small, some are large, and we do need to address some of these in detail. There are a couple of main groups of things that are going to make up our plasma membrane, and so let's take a look at those now. One of the main things that's going to give our membranes their dynamic function are proteins. We'll talk about these proteins in a minute, but for right now you can see that here are some of the proteins that are going to be present in the membrane. Another part of our membrane are phospholipids. And phospholipids are smaller than proteins, but there are so many of them, and they're arranged in this layer called a bilayer, where we actually have two of them. We're going to focus in on these phospholipids a little bit later as well. In addition to proteins and our phospholipids, there are also other structures present in the membrane. Another structure that you might notice is something called cholesterol. Cholesterol is embedded in the membrane here to give it some stability and to help it have a little bit more definitive structure. And then there are a number of things that are actually sticking off of our membrane, and you can see these here. We have things called glycolipids, so this is a little bit of sugar, glyco is sugar, lipid is fat. We have some things called glycoproteins, where we have a little bit of a protein, and now we actually have some sugar sticking off of it. Additionally, you can see that there's even what we call matrix proteins that are not actually embedded within the membrane itself, but they are sticking off of our particular membrane. It's important to realize that this membrane is separating the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell, and that's important. You'll notice that all of the glycoproteins, glycolipids, and the extracellular matrix proteins are sticking to the outside of the cell where we don't have that same level here on the inside of the cell. We aren't going to study every single piece of this membrane in detail, but there are two components of our plasma membrane that we do need to take a closer look at. In studying the plasma membrane, we do have a model that we use in biology to describe it, and that is what we call the fluid mosaic model. It's a model that describes both the structure as well as the function of our membrane. Let's talk about each of these words separately. The term fluid here is not referring to liquid. It's talking about the fact that this membrane is ever-changing. It's fluid in that these proteins can be installed or uninstalled, 
or new phospholipids can be placed within the membrane and then they can be removed at certain times. New glycolipids could be made and built into the membrane. So recognize that these are not like a cement wall where you have all of these pieces put in and they never move, but rather instead they are actually moving around quite a bit, responding to whatever the cell needs to do at any given time. Another word that we use to describe our cell membrane is going to be the word mosaic. So let's just think about what a mosaic is for just a second. Let's take a look at something other than our plasma membrane. Here is a mosaic, a piece of artwork, and what we can notice from this picture is that there are a number of small tiles that are put together to make up the big overall picture. This is the same concept when we think about a plasma membrane, in that we have a number of small pieces that are going to join together to make our big picture. This analogy of a plasma membrane being a mosaic is a good one. We can see that we have a number of small pieces, different sizes, coming together to form the overall picture of our plasma membrane. So the phrase fluid mosaic is a good one, a number of small pieces that are forever changing making up our membrane. As we look at our membrane, we're not going to talk about every single detail here. There are two main components of our membrane though that we do need to give some attention to. Let's start by taking a look at the proteins embedded in the plasma membrane to see some of the different shapes and sizes that we have. An integral protein is a protein right here, and right here, and right here. These are all examples of an integral protein. An integral means that this particular protein is going to span the width of the membrane. So it goes all the way through. A portion of that protein is going to stick up and be toward the outside of the cell, and a portion is going to be present on the inside of the cell. And that's just a description of the size and the dimensions of our membrane proteins. Another protein that you can see is called a peripheral protein. And peripheral proteins are much smaller. You can see right here that this peripheral protein is only going about halfway through the membrane. This would be another example of a peripheral protein. So I just wanted you to be aware that these blue items in the membrane are all proteins. It's just that some are integral and some are peripheral. It's most important for us to understand that with our proteins, proteins really give our membrane function. So when we look at the overall function of our membrane, the proteins play a major role in allowing this membrane to do what it needs to do, which is to be a barrier, a boundary, between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. There are a number of protein functions. It might be a good idea for you to pause the video to go back to question set 8 on page 56 and review what you already know about some of the different functions of proteins. Some of those functions, though, are carried out by proteins that are embedded here in the membrane. And I wanted to just list some of these and review some of these concepts. One of the most obvious, and the one that's going to be the very most important for our case, is the fact that membrane proteins carry out transport. This is the one that we're going to focus on as we make our way through our case. You can see that this protein right here is one that is integral, and like this one over here as well, it has a channel through it. And that is a way that substances would be able to move from in to the cell to out or vice versa. There are a lot of different ways that transport can happen, and it's going to be a major theme in our case. Even so, there are some other functions of proteins in membranes, and I just wanted to list some of the others. We've already talked about the fact that proteins can be enzymes, something that we're going to focus on a lot more later this semester. And sometimes those enzymes are actually embedded in the membrane. Uh, that's not something we see here in this picture, but we could see it in another one. One of the roles that proteins play is for attachment. And this one is pretty obvious, I think, when we take a look at some of these filaments here of our cytoskeleton, and if we look very carefully to where they are, they may actually be touching some of our integral proteins. This is going to help our membrane be stable. 
and it's going to help the inside of our cell, the filaments of our cytoskeleton, actually have a place to attach to maintain cell shape. So using these proteins that are embedded in the membrane is a great way for cells to maintain their shape. Another function that proteins can have embedded in plasma membranes is acting in a way to communicate, something that we call cell-to-cell -cell recognition. It's important in the body that cells are able to identify other cells as both being members of the same organism. This is really the fundamental way that the immune system works. Your immune system looks for cells that do not belong in the body and it launches an attack against them. However, if it encounters one of your own cells that has the correct protein on it, then it likely will not launch any type of immune response. Um, those types of proteins oftentimes can be involved in the cell-to-cell -cell recognition. Finally, proteins in the membrane can serve as receptors. Receptors are a way for an outside chemical to interact with the plasma membrane and start a whole series of signaling to the inside of the cell. So let's talk about an example. Maybe it's time for a cell to make a certain protein and you want to tell the cell to initiate transcription and translation. Perhaps it's a chemical from outside the cell that would attach to a receptor and then that would start a whole cascade of events on the inside of the cell so that transcription and translation takes place and a protein is ultimately produced. So membranes have many different kinds of proteins all performing different functions. Like I said, the one that we'll focus on in this case is going to be a transport protein because that's the one that is defective in a person with cystic fibrosis. The other part of the membrane that I'd like to talk about in more detail are the phospholipids. And what you'll notice in this picture is that the phospholipids are here in two layers and they contain the part that has all of these red balls as well as these things sticking off of them that are pointing to the middle of the membrane. So we need to take a look at what these phospholipids are, what they're made of, why they are in two layers and not just one. Because this is the part of the membrane that really gives our membrane that fluid nature, meaning that the membrane is changing all the time. And these phospholipids can be installed and uninstalled and we can make more membrane or less. And so it's important that we understand how they function. We also need to understand some more about phospholipids because they help make our membrane selectively permeable. That's something we'll define better here in just a few minutes, but um, being selectively permeable means that this membrane is going to regulate what moves in the, into the cell and what moves outside of the cell. What moves across our membrane is highly regulated, and both the phospholipids and our proteins are going to be responsible for the selection of what's allowed to cross membrane. Membranes. So for a few reasons we need to talk about why these phospholipids in the membrane are so important. If we took just one phospholipid and actually looked at it close up, this is what we would see right here. And I want to dissect this one out so that we understand some of the different parts of this phospholipid. Let's just break down the word. If we start with the root phospho, that actually refers to a phosphate group. Now we've seen phosphate groups before. We saw one in each nucleotide in DNA, and we have a phosphate group that will be here as well. And that phosphate group is going to be present in this round head. So we actually call this part of our phospholipid the head end. It kind of looks like a mutant stick person or something, and so this head is going to be where the phosphate group is. This phosphate group has a charge on it, and that means that this phosphate head, this phosphate group in the head, is going to mix well with water. So I hope we remember this word hydrophilic, um, hydro meaning water, and philic meaning loving. So anything that is hydrophilic is going to mix well with water. What that means for our membrane is that anywhere that we have a head of our phospholipid, it's likely going to be coming in contact with water. So that's the first thing to note about our phospholipid. The second thing to talk about is the lipid part. Where's the lipid? Well, these uh, squiggly lines that we see coming off of our phospholipid, 
phospholipid head are what we call the tails, and there are two of them. And these are essentially long chains of fatty acids. And we know that fatty acids are going to be things that don't mix with water. Um, if we remember back to our unit on chemistry, we realized that there were certain things that mixed with water and certain things that didn't. And fat, as you found, vegetable oil at home, simply did not. And so you can kind of think of these tails as being similar to that. So they're not hydrophilic. Instead, these tails are hydrophobic, water-fearing. So if you brought a water molecule close to this phospholipid, then it's going to orient itself so that the hydrophilic end will interact with the water, but the hydrophobic tails will try to move away from our water molecule. So if the phospholipids are a component of our plasma membrane, this presents a little bit of a challenge because if we were to look at a cell, so let's actually look at the second picture over here, and let's say that this is the outside of the cell here and down here is the inside of the cell, there's water on the inside of the cell as part of the cytoplasm. And on the outside of the cell, there's water out here as well in between cells in something called interstitial space. It's just a term that you might come across in your reading, not one you need to know. But that's where water can be located on the outside of cells. So if we're going to have a membrane that separates the inside of our cell from the outside of our cell, then we can see that we have to have two layers of phospholipids. So we've got a layer here. So here's one layer. And we have a second layer here. And it's really important that we understand the orientation of the phospholipids in this phospholipid bilayer, two layers. What I hope we notice is that the phospholipid heads are going to be to the outside of our membrane, meaning that these phospholipids here are facing the outside of our cell where there's water. And these phospholipid heads are facing the exterior of the membrane, which is pointing to the inside of the cell where there is also water. So in this way, our phospholipid heads, whether that water is on the inside or the outside of the cell, those phospholipid heads will interact with the water that's there. On the other hand, we said that our fatty acids do not want to interact with our water. And so these fatty acids are going to be located to the interior of the membrane. Not the interior of the cell, the interior of the membrane. And in that way, they won't have to interact with water. So it's important that we understand the structure of a single phospholipid, the fact that they're located in a bilayer to make up plasma membranes, and then finally that the orientation of our phospholipids in that bilayer is such that our tails are located to the interior of the membrane and the phospholipid heads are located to the exterior of the membrane facing outward and facing inward. So if we zoom back out again and look at our plasma membrane. I hope now we can see a lot more detail than we noticed before. Again, we can see our phospholipid bilayer. So here's one of our layers with the heads pointing one direction. Um, here's our second layer with the heads pointing to the inside of the cell. And then our tails are located in the middle. And then embedded in all of this are going to be our proteins. So we can see transport proteins and some functioning as receptors. Some are integral. Some are going to be peripheral. And it's really these proteins and these phospholipids that make this particular membrane so selective in what it allows to move across it. And that's what we need to address next. How is it that these proteins and phospholipids work together to make sure that we have a barrier, a boundary, that maintains the integrity of the cell? When we say that plasma or cell membranes are selectively permeable, what we're saying is that they will allow some substances to move across them in or out of the cell, and other things will be excluded, meaning some things will be retained inside the cell and won't be able to leave, and many things on the outside of cells will not be allowed to enter into the cells. Both our phospholipids and our proteins are going to play a role in this. So one of the things that we need to explore now is 
how do substances move across membranes, if they're allowed to move across membranes, and why would a substance move a particular direction, like into the cell versus out of the cell. So I wanted to make sure that we um, talk about what it means to have a concentration gradient, and for that we need to review some of our previous uh, terms that we've used before, solute, solvent, and solution. I hope we remember that when we've talked about solutes in the past that this is a substance that is dissolved. And when you have dissolved substances before, you use things like salt or sugar. We'll use some others this week in our next lab. Remember that it's our solvent that does the dissolving. And I hope we we'll remember back from our chemistry lab that our water is the universal solvent. It doesn't dissolve everything. We saw that it didn't mix with some things, but it dissolves many things, especially on the inside and outside of cells. Finally, when we put these two things together, dissolving a solute into a solvent, we have a solution. So if we have a solution, we know that there's water present there and that there are probably more than one solutes that are dissolved in them. And this really gets at the heart of comparing different solutions that might be separated by a plasma membrane and trying to understand what a concentration gradient is. Essentially, a gradient means that we have a difference. So think about a hill for an example. If we have a hill, we have a top of a hill and a bottom of a hill, and the gradient helps us understand the difference between the two. We can have gradients with regard to a number of different parameters, but the one that we're interested in is a concentration gradient. And that simply means that we might have an area where we have a high concentration of one substance on one side of the membrane and a low concentration of a substance on an opposite side of a membrane. High concentration here means that we have a lot more solute, if that's what we're talking about, than over here in our low concentration where there would be less solute. So maybe you can think of uh, sweet tea. You could have sweet tea that has just a little bit of sugar in it. It's got a little bit of sweetness. That might be a lower concentration of sugar. Whereas if you've had sweet tea that has a lot of sugar in it, then you're thinking about something that has a higher concentration of sugar molecules per the milliliter of water that's there. So you actually understand this concept in relationship to how we add solutes to water all the time. We're just formalizing our language here. So let's take a look at a picture that's a little bit more formal than what we just talked about and one that's in your course manual. And make sure that we understand what it means to have a phospholipid bilayer and concentration gradient across that phospholipid bilayer. Let's look in our first panel here and make sure that we can identify, of course, the inside of the cell, the outside of the cell, and our phospholipid bilayer. And we're going to leave the proteins out of our discussion right now. These black dots that you see here rep represent for us a solute. And in between the solute molecules, we have water molecules. That was our solvent that has dissolved the solute. So that tells us that here in this scenario, in this first panel, we have over here on this side of the membrane a high concentration because there's a bunch of solute. And over here, we have a low concentration because there's not any solute. Let's talk about how this particular solvent might be able to move across this membrane. If our particular solute is able to cross our membrane, and we're going to look at very specific examples in a minute, this particular solute is going to move directly through the phospholipid bilayer, and it's going to make its way through and into the cell. And so in our second panel here, we're able to see that these black solute dots are moving from an area of high concentration, we still have high concentration here, to an area of low concentration. That is essentially our definition of diffusion. When we think about what diffusion is, diffusion is where molecules be very generic here, molecules move from high concentration 
to low concentration. And we can see that most obviously in this middle panel. You actually understand this concept all the time. Uh, when you think about maybe somebody in your kitchen making popcorn, eventually you can smell it in another area of the house. That is molecules, chemicals, that are moving from an area of high concentration, your kitchen, near the popcorn machine, and as they diffuse and disperse themselves throughout the house, then they are demonstrating diffusion because they're moving to areas of low concentration. So you could think about a lot of different examples where you might smell something or add a solute to something that you're eating and you might stir it to actually promote diffusion. In our final panel, if we compare the outside to the inside of the cell, we could see that the distribution of our solute molecule is roughly equal. And so at this point we would say these two solutions have reached equilibrium, where we have the same amount of solute on one side as we do on the other, and therefore no more uh, net diffusion will take place. What I mean by that is there are certainly still going to be the molecules that will move from this direction to this direction. However, we're also going to have an equal movement of molecules from inside the cell to out. So diffusion is still taking place, it's just that it's going to not be a gain like we saw in our second panel here. So we would say here on the end they've come to equilibrium. I hope that we can understand diffusion very simply here. This happens in cells. We'll talk about substances that actually can move this way in just a minute. But before we do that, I want to emphasize that this example that we've looked here at here is an example of what we call passive transport. There are a few different types of tr passive transport, and diffusion is one of them. And the reason why it's passive is because it doesn't require any energy. So no energy is required. We didn't see any energy invested in this particular example. Substances moved without any en energy input from ATP from an area of high to an area of low. And so this is why this is an example of passive transport. Now that we've talked about how a substance could move by simple diffusion across the phospholipid bilayer directly, let's get more specific about what kinds of substances are allowed to move this way. If we think about a substance in this particular example, uh, this uh, black solute, then we know that this molecule, if it's going to pass between our phospholipids and interact with the phospholipid tails, has to be relatively small. So this molecule right here, any of these solutes, have to be small. That's the first criteria that we have to have if something is going to move by simple diffusion directly through the phospholipids. Another criteria is that these small molecules have to be able to interact with the tails. It means that they have to be hydrophobic. Remember that our tails are fatty acid chains. They don't mix with water. They're hydrophobic. And therefore, we would have to have something small that is also able to interact with those. There are two examples that I would like you to know. Uh, one is a gas, so various gases, I should say. So when things like oxygen gases move across membranes, they move this direction. And I hope you'd realize that oxygen would move from outside the cell to inside the cell. Um, but carbon dioxide is also a gas, and it's going to move by simple diffusion directly through the phospholipids, and it moves from inside to outside the cell. So that's one example. And then another example are what we call fat-soluble vitamins. There are a variety of vitamins. Some are water-soluble. We're only talking about the ones here that are fat-soluble. Fat-soluble vitamins, if they're small enough, can move into cells in this way through simple diffusion. So there's not a lot of things actually that are going to be able to move into cells via simple diffusion because we have so many more things that have to move in and out of cells that aren't small and that are not hydrophobic. So we also need to find an alternative for some of those things. This is a picture that helps us compare something that we've talked about already, uh, this perspective right here, which is simple diffusion 
with the next type of diffusion that we need to talk about. The next type of diffusion that we need to address is here on this side right here. And this is called facilitated diffusion. I want to stress that facilitated diffusion is still a type of passive transport, meaning that in this picture we also don't see any energy involved. It's still a passive process. The difference is, is that rather than moving directly through the phospholipids, any substance that moves by facilitated diffusion has to cross the membrane through a protein and we can see our large protein molecule here. I'll color this in yellow. This is one of those transport proteins that we talked about. This one has a channel running through it that's going to allow a substance to move through it. And these protein channels are really specific, meaning that if this is going to allow an amino acid to go through it, it won't also allow a glucose molecule to go through it. So if you want to move things into and out of the cell, you actually have to have a lot of different kinds of proteins embedded in the membrane because each one of them kind of gets their own channel. So facilitated diffusion is still a passive process and it's different from simple diffusion in that it requires a protein. I want you to think a little bit about the word facilitated for just a minute. Facilitated means to help. So if you are a facilitator of a group, uh, you're not necessarily in charge of everything. What you're doing is you're just trying to help get things going and sort of direct and gently move the direction of the conversation uh, the way we want it to go. So a facilitator is a helper, and that's exactly what our proteins are doing. They're helping them move. Substances are still going to move from an area of high concentration here. So here we have our high concentration to an area of low concentration, and that's why it's considered to be passive. Let's talk about some examples of substances that move across membranes via facilitated diffusion. One example is glucose. We already know that glucose is required as an input for cellular respiration. It's the way that the cell makes energy, gets its energy. And so glucose will move into cells through proteins, but they're still moving from an area of high glucose concentration on the outside of the cell through the protein by facilitated diffusion to an area of low concentration on the inside of the cell. Other substances like amino acids, and you know a lot about amino acids already. Amino acids are the building blocks for proteins. So if on the inside of your cell you need to build a lot of protein through the process of transcription and translation, then you have to deliver these amino acids to cells. They have to move by facilitated diffusion through proteins from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So I hope you're starting to see the key similarities and differences between simple and facilitated diffusion. Now that we know the difference between simple and facilitated diffusion, let's review and talk about a few other substances that move across membranes and how they do that. So glucose, which is a polar molecule, is going to move across by facilitated diffusion. So that is going to require protein. Oxygen or carbon dioxide, we know that those are nonpolar molecules, and we said that those move by simple diffusion. Anything that's going to be a hydrophilic compound is going to not be able to interact with those tails that are hydrophobic. So anything that's hydrophilic is going to require a, is going to require a protein and move by facilitated diffusion. Whereas anything that's hydrophobic, assuming it's small enough, will be able to move directly across the phospholipid bilayer by simple diffusion. If we think about cations or anions, we know that they have charges. So let's think about a sodium and a plus ion. Sodium can move in and out of the cell, and anions like chloride could also move in and out of cells. And because they have a charge on them, it means that they will not be able to interact with our hydrophobic tails. Therefore, all ions will require a protein, and they will move by facilitated diffusion. Fat-soluble vitamins, as we said, if they're small enough, can interact with those tails, 
and they will move directly through the phospholipids. What do you think about water? We know that water is polar, it's a polar substance. And so at first glance, we would say, well, water would have to move through a protein because it wouldn't be able to interact with those hydrophobic tails. And in part, that's true. We know that there are some protein channels, a process of facilitated diffusion, that actually allows water to move in and out of cells. And with this particular substance, those channels actually have their own name. They're called aquaporins. On the other hand, we do see evidence that water can move by simple diffusion as well. We wouldn't expect it to be able to, but it seems as though phospholipid tails sometimes will get out of the way and sort of create an area where the water molecules can move through. So water's kind of a mixed bag, and it's something that we'll address next when we talk about osmosis. Now that we understand the specifics of how many molecules can move via simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion, we need to talk about the special case of water. Because when we're talking about osmosis, we're really talking about water only. And so our definition of osmosis is that it is the diffusion of water. And everything that came with our initial definition of diffusion, meaning that we have to have an area of high concentration and an area of low concentration, are going to apply now here to the case of water. So I'd like us to look together at an image that you have in your course manual, and this will help us break down exactly what's happening as water is moving. You have a picture of a beaker, and this beaker has water in it, and you also inside of this beaker have a bag and this bag is a dialysis bag this is actually something that you're going to be doing a lab on later this week a dialysis bag feels a little bit like uh, saran wrap and you'll actually be able to close off the ends uh, with a solution trapped on the inside of it and then you can take that whole bag and place it in water now what's important about this bag that you can see right here and I'm sort of drawing on a purple here along the line of the bag that it is a membrane and this membrane like our cell membranes are going to be selectively permeable that this membrane here around our bag can allow certain substances through but it can exclude certain substances as well now, the reason why it would exclude or allow things across is based really here only on one thing, and that's on size. Really tiny molecules are allowed to move across this membrane, either in or out of the bag. Uh, large molecules are going to be trapped wherever we start out with them, whether they're inside or outside of the bag. So this is a really good analogy for how cells function when they are in a human body or an amoeba cell in a, in a puddle or if we're looking at a plant cell. Um, there's a lot of ways that we can think about these dialysis bag acting as cells, but recognize we're only taking in one criteria here, and that's size. We're not necessarily taking in the criteria of whether something's polar or nonpolar or charged or not. I also want you to be aware of how this picture is different from one we've looked at before. In this case, we are using these small black dots to represent a water molecule. So I hope you can see that out here in the beaker that this is a beaker of water and water only. And we're using these black dots to help us understand that each one of these black dots is representing an H2O. And that's different because in our previous picture it was referring to a solute molecule. In this particular initial picture, we've also taken some large particle, um, whatever it might be, and we've put it in our dialysis bag. And I will tell you that this large particle is too big to be able to move across the membrane. So we know that that particle is going to stay on the inside of our dialysis bag. So it's too big to move. However, our water molecules are small enough. They can move through the membrane if they're so motivated and if there's the appropriate gradient for them to move. So if we're going to try to understand why our water would move one direction or another across our membrane, we need to take what we learned about that definition of diffusion and apply it here. So let's do this. Let's first talk about our solute.
So let's talk about this large thing that we have here. And we realize that that large solute is going to be in high concentration inside of our bag. So this is high solute concentration. And out here in our water we have low solute concentration. So that's what we want to start with. And maybe this large solute is sugar, or maybe this large solute is an amino acid, whatever it might be that we're examining. Now we need to think about our gradient with regard to water. So let's find where we have the highest concentration of water molecules. So it's out here in our beaker with all of our water molecules that we have a high concentration of water. So I'm just going to write high water, which means we have more water. And while there may be some water molecules on the inside of our bag here, there aren't going to be very many. So the inside of our bag is an area of low water molecules. There's just fewer in there because the large red solute is taking up so much more space. So if we're trying to predict which direction water will move, we need to know where water is in high concentration and where it's in low concentration. And it's going to be just the opposite of where we have our high and low solute concentration. So we can think of this a couple of ways. When water is going to move by osmosis, water is always going to move from an area where water is in high concentration toward an area where water is in low concentration. So one way to think about this is that water moves from an area of high water down its concentration gradient to where we have low water concentration. So in this scenario, we'd actually have water moving into the bag. There's another way that you can think about it if it's helpful for you, and that is water is always going to try to dilute where we have more solute. So I know we're sort of putting human terms here to a water molecule, but it tries to dilute um, area of high solute. So if you can think about our solute right here inside of our bag and it can't get out, then the goal of water is to try to go there to dilute it. So you might be able to think of it that way as well. Water is always going to follow our solute and so it's going to go toward where it is. It doesn't matter to me which way is easiest for you to remember. You'll just need to be able to predict in many different scenarios which direction water is going to move. So water is going to move into our bag, and we can see after a few minutes here that in our final bag, our bag got larger. It swelled up. And you can see that because water had moved into that bag, and our solute couldn't escape. It couldn't get out. So I hope that we understand that water moved from outside of our bag to inside of the bag by the process of osmosis. And it moved from an area of high water to low water. It moved from an area to try to dilute where our solute was located. All right, I hope that makes sense. When we are comparing different substances, we have some terms that we use. And I'd like to talk about those terms now. Whenever we have a solution, like one on the inside of our bag versus the one on the outside of our bag, let's go back to our initial picture here for just a second. If there's a concentration difference between the two, we say that wherever we have more of our solute, so that's going to be here on the inside of our cell, and let's uh, color that red to be consistent. The solution on the inside of our bag that has a higher concentration of our solute, we're going to term this hypertonic. This word hyper means above, higher, so it has a higher solute concentration. And this word tonic is a word we use a lot in biology. It's tonicity, and it has a lot to do with the concentrations of solutions. 
So if we're comparing the inside of our cell to the outside, then we would say that the inside here is going to be hypertonic because it contains a higher concentration of our solute molecules, which are in red. That means that out here in our beaker, where we have a lot of water but not solute at all, we will call this a hypotonic solution. Hypo means low or beneath, and it has less solute. So another way that you can think about water moving in or out of a cell or a bag in this scenario is that water always moves from a solution that's hypotonic to one that's hypertonic. And that might be the third way that we can think about the direction that water will move. Incidentally, if we have two solutions that happen to have equal concentrations of solute and water on either side of a membrane, we would call those isotonic. That's not represented in this picture here. Hope we remember that iso means equal. So if you have two solutions that have the same concentration, then we would say they're isotonic to one another. These terms are going to play a much bigger role after we do our lab and look at some scenarios uh, in human cells and in plant cells, and so we'll come back and use these terms quite a bit. Now that we've talked about simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis, there's one more type of transport that we need to address. So far, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis have all been passive processes. At no point have we talked about energy necessary to move any of these substances. However, there are times where we do need to invest energy to move something across a membrane, and that is very specifically active transport. So you have a figure in your course manual that compares active transport to both simple and facilitated. The reason why active transport requires energy, and it does, and the type of energy, by the way, that it requires very directly is ATP. We haven't talked a lot about ATP this semester, we will, but this is the energy currency of the cell. It's the way that the cell actually can utilize a certain type of energy. And you can see that actually represented in part right here. We've got our energy input to power up this protein so that we can move a substance. The reason why we have to have energy is because of the direction that we are moving our substances. In this case, substances are being moved or pumped against their concentration gradient. So you can think about trying to push a bike uphill or to try to bail water out of a boat that has a hole in it. In these scenarios, you're trying to go against a concentration gradient. So in our picture here, you can see that this is an area of high concentration on the outside of the cell. You can see that we have an area of low concentration on the inside of the cell, and we want to take this solute and move it against that gradient from an area of low concentration to high concentration. And that's why we require energy. I hope you can also see that this requires a protein. So this thing that we've got embedded in our membrane here, this protein, is required in order to make this possible. Um, if not, then there wouldn't be a way to really use um, anything else as a pump. Now that we've covered all of the different types of transport, let's take a look at summarizing them in the chart. Let's start with what we just finished up with in talking about ATP. I hope we remember that simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis do not require any energy. And that means that they are always moving with the concentration gradient. It means substances are always moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration. And that's going to be true for all three of these scenarios, even water. Water is always going to move down its concentration gradient from an area of high to low. But we said that in active transport, we have just the opposite. It's going to move against the concentration gradient from an area of low to high. And then, of course, that's going to require energy. We also saw some differences in these different transport processes and what requires a protein and what doesn't. Simple diffusion did not require a protein. Neither did osmosis in the example that we looked at. However, both facilitated diffusion, needing a helper, and active, transport, active transport, 
needing a pump, we're going to require a protein. In terms of the examples that we've looked at, for simple diffusion, we've talked about gases, and we talked about small things that were hydrophobic. Facilitated diffusion is going to move glucose, amino acids, and ions, cations or anions. Osmosis, we talked about the special case of water. We didn't look at an example of active transport, but one that I would like you to be familiar with, just know the name of, is that on most cells, there is a pump that is going to pump sodium against its concentration gradient, at the same time pumping potassium against its concentration gradient in order to maintain the right concentrations of these in and out of the cell. And that's really important for how the nervous system functions. So the sodium-potassium pump is a good example of active transport. I'll let you fit in, fill in description. These are really just definitions that we've talked about at previous places in our course manual. I hope by looking at our plasma membrane and talking about all the different ways that it can be selectively permeable and how substances can move in and out of the membrane will help us understand a little bit more about our case study with cystic fibrosis. As we move forward and think about how substances move across membranes, we'll want to focus in on specifically what goes wrong in the protein that is required for healthy cells in the respiratory system. And that's something that we're going to address as we move forward.